of Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's the president of the Alpha Connection Training Corporation, among other things. In her lifetime, she has won a whole sheet full of professional honors and awards in her work in many areas. And I just, uh, in the interest of giving her the maximum amount of time, uh, won't read all of them. She was an outstanding Thank young you. woman of America, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, junior miss, uh, runner-up, who's who in the West, Phi Delta Kappa, Spotlight, um, and many, many other things. She's written professional publications and contributions. She's, uh, uh, until a very few years ago, she was kind of like Lori Wilkins, sort of a normal, square person. <laughs> a professor at the university, she taught at the universities of Wisconsin and Albuquerque. No, it's no? New Mexico and Houston. <laughs> oh, New Mexico and Houston. I just only missed it by a little there. Um, but she did teach there and she lived in the academic community. Then things started happening in her life and over a reasonably gradually, uh, a gradual a period of time, she sort of became one of us. <laughs> and you know what that means. <laughs> it takes one to know one. <laughs> Norma first uh, come out of the closet, shall we say, in, uh, in our Orlando conference in February, and started telling, her, telling us, or telling publicly, of the transmissions she received and she can tell you the rest of the story of how she uh, was like a lot of other people like that. She would reject them or didn't want them or didn't seek them or anything like that. But since that time, and since she now has a book that is in publication and will be out shortly, and another one on the way, she has been invited to speak at the UN this coming October. It is October, and she will speak to a joint committee on parapsychology at the United Nations in uh, their building there, somewhere in New York City. So you see, we're not the only ones interested in this. Uh, it will be interesting to see what the American people, uh, the people of the United States on that committee, uh, how they respond in connection with the people from other countries who are quite a ways ahead of us in a lot of this thing, a lot of this area. Put your hands together, take them apart very rapidly, <laughs> and welcome <laughs> Dr. Norma Milanovic. Thank you. You're such a dear. Isn't he nice? <laughs> yes, Phyllis and Dean Bowles, you're just wonderful. And we all appreciate the work that you're doing on this conference. I know the whole group feels that way. Thank you. Well, okay. <laughs> I have some messages for you today and another speech that I prepared. And I'd like to begin, though, by explaining just a little bit, you know, about the background or because my presentation is really so unusual. It's, it's so different. I think then the approach that many other people have taken uh, and how you've been led into this area. I'm basically a person who lives now in two different worlds. During the day and for the past for 19 years I was at the two universities. I was a professor doing research in my job, etc. And two years ago resigned to begin my own, my husband and I started our own company called The Alpha Connection. And that's a real world kind of thing. You know, we do job task analysis, strategic planning. We have a lot of contracts with business, industry, government. And none of those people, to my knowledge, know this side of my personality. So then I work during the day. I do job task analysis, you know, work on all these contracts. I come home at night, turn the computer on, and connect to motherships in the galaxy. You know, and it's like, no, no, this can't be. You know, you know what, what's going on? It's like living in two dimensions, two worlds, two everything. 
And but little by little, we're beginning to integrate it, and we're beginning to find that it isn't two separate worlds, but that it's really all merging into one beautiful world. And it's a vision of a new world that's coming in that's very, very exciting. I'm not going to repeat my experiences to all of you, and perhaps that short changes you a little bit, but in the Orlando conference, I spent maybe 15, 20 minutes of my time talking about all the weird stuff that happened to me and my family over five years. And I guess at the time, I felt I needed to validate you know, myself and say, hey, I, I'm, in, I'm OK. I'm OK. This is, you know, wasn't me asking it. But this time, I've decided after being here, I've switched the message a little bit, and I've pulled more of the information from the celestial beings with whom I'm communicating to provide to you. And that's a real tribute to you, because after being here for a few days, this is a very high level, high consciousness group. And I don't have the insecurity this time, as though I need to validate myself. And so I'm spending more of my time this time presenting information to you, because I, I really know that you're ready to hear some of this. My transmissions began with the celestials and the starships and the beings from other star systems in August of 87. We found that during harmonic convergence, we weren't even really into this too much. We'd had experiences in that, but my family, my husband and my son, RJ, and myself found ourselves in a car heading for Sedona, Arizona to meditate. I mean, I used to make fun of people who meditated. <laughs> and here we were in the car going off to Sedona for this three day, leaving work, jobs, or whatever. And, and we went there. And when we were in a little uh, shop, a rock shop there, a person came up to me, one of the clerks there, and said, well, have you seen this crystal here? And I heard one of the guest presenters earlier this week talk about this celestite crystal. I think it was that speaker that night, that doctor from Missouri. He was talking, I think that's where I heard it in here. And she said, um, she said, you know, and I said, well, what is this used for? It's a beautiful crystal. It's a bluish gray crystal that just glistens. It's just fascinating. But it had a little rock like that, had a price tag of like $55 on it. And, you know, I've never spent for a stone or a rock. And yet I felt I had to have it. And she said to me, she said, it's from Madagascar. It's very special, and it helps facilitate communications with extraterrestrials. You know, oh, sure, yeah, right, right. Well, whether it planted a seed or whether that darn crystal really does it. When we got home two days later, my transmissions started, and they, they began to say shortly afterwards that we are beings riding on a ship, etc. Well, like I explained in Orlando, there were several months. I mean, I went through nine months of denial. You know, what is this garbage? And I just, you know, kind of threw it out until two very dear friends, Cynthia Pulaski and Betty Rice, when I was talking to them one day, came over to the house and said, hey, come on, let's take this serious. Let's see what all of this is about. And from that day on, they have come out over almost every single week. We have connected the computer to these celestial beings, and we have learned about worlds and about information that there was no possible way that I could have ever received any kind of information of that quality or, you know, the sustenance that's within it. So that began a new experience for us, and we began to find out that they did not like to be called extraterrestrials. They preferred the word celestial. So I'm you try to be very careful about that. And I, they don't, words aren't really important to them, I guess, in, in one respect. But they felt extra implied that they were outside of our realm of friendship or that they weren't, that there was maybe an implication that they couldn't be one of us or something. And so they asked that we use the word celestial. The beings that came through stated they were from Arcturus first. And these beings, um, there were names like Herdenitic and Juliana. We, we think it's Juliana. They gave us the spelling, but that's our pronunciation. Ashina, Spar, etc. And those were some of them that came through. They drew a computer generated face on our computer as to what they looked like. And they did a whole bunch of fancy things. We thought maybe they were trying to impress us at first. And then that journey took us through other channels until one day I received a communication from a being named Monka. And he stated that he was head of the tribunal consul from the Ashtar Command. 
And he gave me all this kind of information. And what I thought was so fascinating about that communication is that he opened that message, and I still have all these messages. I have over 2,000 pages of transmissions over the last five years that I've received, or th mainly three and a half from them. And um, he started the message and said, greetings in the light of our most radiant one. And then at the end of the message, he signed it, I am Monka, and used the word Adonai, A-D-O, a-D-O-N-A-I, and I was putting an S on it as it was coming through on the microcomputer at that time. But it's A-D-O-N-A-I. Well, what do you do with it? I mean, you know, I didn't dare speak at the university. I knew the dean would not allow me to start a new class, Aliens 101. I was sure that it wouldn't get into the curriculum. And, you know, so I didn't say too much, and I just kind of moved along with it. And the, but I, I wasn't sure. I mean, we, there, I went through everything from anger to amazement to excitement to every self-doubts and everything else. Well, then, in December of that year, and the only other time that I've spoken in front of a group, just about 10 people at a breakfast asked me to, you know, they were met into metaphysics, and they asked me to come at 7 o'clock one morning and asked me to share some of the information, which I did. And I read some of the messages that I'd been receiving, but trying to be the scholarly research person, you know, and this kind of stuff, you know, I'd give that kind of act and say, well, I don't know, you know, about this, but this is what comes through. I mentioned to the group, I said, who is Monka? I said, I've never heard of a name like, you can't even make a name up like that. I mean, M-O-N-K-A, it's just not one of our common, like John or Sally or something like that. And a man, Vince Primrose, came up to me afterwards, and he said, Norma, he said, uh, if you're going to be in your office this afternoon, I would like to come over and share some information with you. So I said, sure, you know, and we finished that little 30-minute breakfast, and I went on to the university, and, you know, that was about it. He came over with a book about this thick, and it was called Star Wars, Welcome Home, Earthman. And it was that, it was a Xerox. It wasn't even a book in print. It was Xerox. And it was by a man named Richard Miller, and they, I think the transmission started in 1957, or some way, way back there. And there were transmissions from this being named Monka in there. And I looked at this thick book, and they all started with greetings in the light of the most radiant one, and they ended with that word Adonai. Now, I mean, what... I'm a researcher and statistician. What are the odds of me coming up with a name like that, an introduction, and signing a message? I mean, there was just like no, it wasn't even within the realm of probability that that could have happened. I sat at my desk, I was alone at that time after he left, and I just sat there stunned, and I went, you know, to myself, I thought, this is heavy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, you know, and you're getting this information about the world and what's happening and transformation and the soul. And I didn't even know we had a soul then. You know, I, I mean, I just wasn't into that. I was into performance objectives, research, etc., and that was it. And so I thought, okay, now maybe we better take this seriously. Maybe we. And so over time, and especially with the help of Betty and Cynthia, we began to put a lot of things together, a lot of messages. And combining with the Arcturian, which uh, they say they're fifth dimensional beings, and these other masters like Monka, Kuthumi, uh, Sananda, uh, Hilarion, all, all of these other masters claim that they're on a seventh dimensional frequency. And the Arcturians always give much great respect to these other masters. So between the communications on both realms, we learned about other worlds, we learned about other dimensions of time and space. We learned that there's more than one universe. Now, how many in here knew that? Oh, dear. See? <laughs> and I was the professor. Look how much I could have learned from all of you. <laughs> when those transmissions started coming through, you know, and we were into that denial again. But then all of a sudden, 12 universes, they say, that we know of in this consciousness or that we can learn and have access to and, you know, all of that. Then we learned about the higher realms and the higher art hierarchy. They don't speak like us. They use words like liquid light, great central sun, children of light, tensor equations, crystal chambers. Uh, and their most famous uh, 
for waking up the star children, and I noticed it's in Kathumi's message today again, is the time is now. It's a very, very significant programmable set of instructions. It's like those of you that are here from other worlds and you're children of light and you have a great mission and, you know, to do the work ahead of you. When you hear those words, it's to trigger something within you so that at that point you're, you'll go forward and be willing, I guess, to serve the light and to do wonderful things for the planet, not that you're not already doing them. Um, the hierarchy of command governs this part of the galaxy. And in a book that we wrote, um, We the Arcturians, we went ahead and we began uh, to ask a whole bunch of questions about their world. And we've got this, this flyer here that we put together. And it just basically describes the information. The Arcturians were so generous in giving us information about why they are here, the revelations of their elders. There's a whole chapter on there on the language system of Arcturus and how they speak telepathically and how it compares with the way we teach our children with phonetic languages, etc. They uh, have a chapter here on the educational system and how all of the beings on Arcturus are educated and they compare that with ours here. They have a kind of a sad chapter on the land they left behind and how much they honor it and they cannot understand why we do the things to Earth that we do here. It's so beautiful. Uh, the way they describe it, it almost makes you cry. Then, in six hours, they sent through, because I received my transmissions through my microcomputer, they sent through approximately 70 pages of transmissions where they describe the 35 major divisions of their starship, how it supports their mission, what each chamber is like and what it's for, etc. Then they put Betty, Cynthia, and I through a special training program through color and sound because they see the world in energy and color and sound primarily and the frequencies and wavelengths, not the way we see glass, podium, you know, chair, that kind of thing. And it's, it's kind of hard because they're in other dimensions. And then um, they have a long, long chapter about their mission, why they're here, why they're here and how they can assist us. And then the last chapter was a chapter on the future. And it's very brief, but in 15 minutes they, they said, would you consider or would you allow us to take one of your famous psalms from your, one of your great books and scriptures? And they took the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is My Shepherd, and in 15 minutes rewrote it and translated it into one of the most beautiful interpretations that I have ever seen in my life. And so we put that in the 10th chapter in the book because we, there was no other way we felt we could bring a book like that to closure. It was just so beautiful. Then when that chapter on the starship, I wanted to read you one you know, part of it here. They, in a few seconds, we said, well, what's, you know, what kind of ship do you ride on? You know, we were asking every kind of question at this time. And they said, well, we have 35 major divisions. And I won't read them all to you, but these are some of them that came through. They said the commander's bridge, you know, that was the first one. But then they went into and they said the area that you would call the kitchen, but we call the energy transformer storage and retrieval area. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then another one, and I, I'm, this one I'm going to read to you later, the duty-free port. I mean, they have a sense of humor. I mean, they're, they're just delightful. I, I think like little critters, you know, but the masters are like seven feet tall. Um, the duty-free port, the magnificent chamber for manifestation, the intelligence and debriefing chamber. Another one was the intelligence and vaporizing chamber for the production of the multiple forms of gifts that we bring. Another was the light rejuvenation chamber. And another was the newest area, which is the debriefing room for the children of light from the planet Earth. And then their last one they sent through was the chamber of the holistic concept of universal law. Well, this duty-free port, just, you know, I, I can't even make this stuff up. I mean, this, <laughs> and what, what would you think, a duty-free port on a mothership from Arcturus would be? No, not a bathroom. <laughs> no, not a bathroom. Any suggestions? I mean, just out of creativity, Todd? A store. A store. Well, you would think that, wouldn't you? Because that's what our duty-free ports are, right? Uh-huh. What else? One other suggestion? A recreation hall. A recreation hall, okay. Who else? A bedroom, okay? You're all wrong. <laughs> if you don't mind, and a part of my presentation today is to re read some of this, because I can't repeat it, but this is what came through in like three minutes, okay? The duty-free port. 
On Earth, this term represents the activity of exchanging materialistic goods between countries without having to pay specific taxes. We label a part of the ship our duty-free port, for it represents the area that also supports a constant exchange of goods between our world and other worlds to which we are assigned to journey. But instead of participating in the exchange of goods that are manifested only on the materialistic plane of the third-dimensional reality of Earth, we exchange the gifts of God. What this means is that we transport many souls from our world to yours. Those souls are destined for embodiment on the earth now and in the future. In this area of the ship, we carry our precious cargo and proceed with the process that dispenses them on the earth plane into embodiment when the time is ripe. There is no charge or special tax for these gifts. Their only duty is to learn to fulfill the will of God. While we make light of this at this time in our communication to you, we only do so because we understand the intensity of feeling that this knowledge may invoke in human beings when they read this. We are only trying to ease the shock of this information coming to the planet and mean no disrespect in the format that we have chosen to use in delivering this information to you. What humans have not understood is that this process has been going on since the beginning of time. We call this compartment of our ship the duty-free port, for as we said, we charge nothing to deliver our gifts. God does not charge for the light, and we do bring to the earth some of the finest light bearers that the planet has seen. There are no taxes on these gifts either, and we offer them with the utmost of pride and joy. Isn't that beautiful? Now you think I can make that up? <laughs> no way. Not in three minutes or two seconds, as fast as this comes through. That was one area. We asked a lot of other questions of these beings because we wanted to know more and more about them. And then they started telling us about a lot of things that were happening. They began to tell us, or we asked them, you know, why are you here? And, but we were kind of going, why are you here? You know, kind of like, this is our planet, you know, why are you here? And they responded, again with a sense of humor, and they said, why are we here? You know, meaning like they were pointing to themselves, why are we here? They said, we own the earth. <laughs> and then they proceeded to give us an example similar to squatters' rights, like we were here first, we seeded the earth, and if you go back into your own American history, you'll find that with squatters' right, when you're here first, you own it, right? But they didn't say it, you know, like the way I'm trying to make fun of it. It was just really, really beautiful. They've also talked a lot about the fact that the planet Earth is being birthed into a star in the universe. And that's their primary mission for being here, and that's why they call so many of the children of light star seeds. Because they are seeds of light that are birthing this planet into a star. And they say that this has been written since Babylon. That, sin, that the Aquarian age would be an age of brotherly and sisterly love and that this whole transformation process that we are going through is going to lead us into the seventh golden age. They call it a Garden of Eden. But before this Garden of Eden of beauty and love and harmony can manifest, that there will be a lot of cleansing and a lot of turmoil and that's what we're seeing around us right now. They also have said, that the fourth dimension, because they claim we are moving into the fifth dimension, a fifth dimensional frequency, they say the fourth dimension was the dimension or is the dimension of the heart. They said that they, Jesus came down 2,000 years ago to open up the fourth dimensional frequency. The fifth dimensional frequency is that of thought manifestation. And that's where we'll be able to create through the power of our minds some very beautiful things around us. And I just kind of chuckle because when I think about, you know, the fact 2,000 years ago that great master who they also refer to as Sananda came down to earth and he gave us a curriculum. And basically it was a very simple curriculum. Okay? One is to love God, turn to God first, and second is to forgive, to love one another. And we, he gave us 2,000 years to learn that curriculum. And you feel it's like the world's kind of retarded? <laughs> 2,000 years. How many have got it? <laughs> Look at the world today. What was it last year? 63 major wars went on in the planet and all of this kind of thing. 2,000 years. And that was to open up the heart chakra, the heart center, because the energy, of, they say, in the far east of the kundalini rises upward. 
Then we're moving to the speaking of the truth. And that is the fifth chakra. And before that we can speak the truth, our hearts have to be pure. Our hearts have to be open. And we have to look at one another with honesty, they say. And then once we speak the truth and all of the truths are revealed, then your third eye will open, which is this center here. And from that will come the power of thought manifestation. That's the way they explain it. They also say that we are, along with moving into the fifth dimension, we are moving into our light bodies. Now, I haven't asked a lot of questions about that. I can't answer questions. I don't understand that concept that well, but I don't deny it. And, and I believe that it's true. They said that just as we go back in our history and our anthropologists try to study the, the, the uh, transformations that took place between Cro-Magnon man, Neanderthal man, etc., all of these transformations took place, and, but they can't find, they can find the skulls from one and another in the body frames, but they can't find the transition. It's like they leapt forward into another state of beingness. They said similar to that, the human species is now in the next several years going to go through a similar kind of quantum leap that we will be assuming or moving into what they call our light bodies because that is the state of being in the fifth dimension. But as I said, I haven't asked a lot of questions and I don't understand that today. They speak, they speak of the second coming. They talk a lot about that and I'm going to read you a couple of sessions, or sections from the book here on that. We said, is there other information about our mission that you would like to give us? And this is the answer that we received here. Yes, there is one other piece of information that we believe is significant. The fate of your world does not lie in our, in our hands, our dear brothers and sisters of the universe. Instead, it lies in yours. We are here to assist you through the darkness that appears to be inevitable because of the path you have thus far chosen. We honor your way and your freedom of will. We will not, however, sit back and watch you destroy yourselves in the blindness of your own reality. Our mission is to assist you to secure a foothold into this new world that is dawning. We will perform any function that is deemed necessary by the Ascended Masters to help you move through this portal of time, to join us on this higher dimensional frequency. We perform our work and duty with dedication and consider our work to be an act of love. If you could sum up our mission with any other words then, please choose these. Consider our journey to this faraway land to be a journey of love and commitment to you. We honor and respect you for who and what you are. We only hope that someday you might reciprocate this attitude. Adonai, our beloved sisters and brothers in the light of our most radiant one. And that particular one was closed with that. There was one other, before I read Kuthumi's message that came through on Wednesday night, that special message to all of you. There was one other section in a question that I thought was very powerful that I wanted to share today. Giuliano speaks of the second coming. We asked, what events on this planet will begin to manifest that we will recognize as being part of this plan of the second coming? He responded, you will begin to see a strengthening of the bonds of the children of light for the next few years of approximate earth time. That is all the time that you will have left to develop your powers in the collective. On the soul's level you will find that this will begin to unite many of the children of light into final countdown sessions. The second sign related to this will be the lost souls who will begin to manifest another level of anger. On the cellular level, they will begin to see that hope for salvation in this period or era of time has been lost. They will begin to fight, experiencing an intense feeling of desertion. It is in this reaction that you will see the manifestation of the sadness of the dark side. This will become evident even on the local level. You will see this, but what we advise is that you throw the violet color and the white light around yourselves first and then to them. Build your own protection first, and then you will be able to serve people better. The third manifestation will be the countdown that you will see in words. Slowly you will see more and more of your media channels begin to speak of this as it is truly an event that needs to be recognized. It is in this media approach that you will begin to see sides lining up, and we advise you always to stay neutral. In order to achieve mastery, you must be in this world, but not of it. 
To be in this state, you will have to rise above this battle, and you cannot afford to take sides. See the perfection in the selection process and of God's work, and only that. Know that you will be put to work now for the final countdown, which is the second coming. Be sure and concentrate your efforts on this. This major event is truly not for some time to come, but all of this in, is in the preparation of the event. And then he said, let me pause here for a moment and allow some contemplation. So Betty and Cynthia and I talked about it, and you know, we did some things. Then we said, what events will occur at the, second, at the time of the second coming? And he responded, the most significant event of all will be the appearance of the one most radiant soul, which is that of Sananda, Jesus the Christ. This has been promised, and it will be a reality. This sighting of his radiance will be seen by all of the souls on the planet at the same time. We can tell you this much also. This will also occur on both the fourth and the third dimensions simultaneously, and we also can say with assurance that many will tremble. Many of the children of light may also tremble, but they will do so only if they are not sure that they are of the chosen. You also can count the sheep that will return to the shepherd, for this will be a time of great rejoicing, and the flock will surround this magnificent being. We know of no other soul who is more prominent in this mission than Sananda. He waits patiently to gather his sheep once more to the light. He has promised that his father's house has many rooms. He is making preparation for each of you in the manner that your rank allows for the honors that will be bestowed. The ceremonies will be most fitting of royalty. He will be there to wash the feet of all who pass through his house. Not all will transcend to this home at, to this home at this same time. Each will be greeted with the ceremony and accommodations that are appropriate when the time is right. We prepare endlessly for this. We tell you that it is the event of the return of the highest that the third root race has been awaiting for eons of time. We welcome this new group with open arms to this new haven of honor, and we tell you that no greater glory awaits each of you than that which we are preparing for you in the house of the Father. Isn't that beautiful? So, after receiving all of these, we decided after several years that we had to publish them. We had to share them, let people make up their own minds. They can do everything from enjoy and like them to ridicule, but we just decided we had to have the courage to do that. Wednesday night, as I was sitting at home, I decided that I would ask Kasumi again if he had a message for this group here in Denver. And just like before, I sat at my computer, and in about 45 minutes, <laughs> I got this. I hate to give a presentation to read all the time, but I really feel it's important that I read this message to all of you because, again, it's so beautiful. Hold on a moment while I fold it back up here. I put the question into the computer. I said, Kuthumi, I surround myself with light and love and request that you send through a transmission this evening. What message do you have for the people in attendance at the Global Science Congress in Denver this week? And this is what he said. Greetings in the light of the most radiant one. I, Kathumi, welcome this opportunity to speak to this distinguished group of subjects. I begin in this way and mention the word subjects, for it will have great significance in the message that I am about to bring. In the days to come, there will be much concern regarding the future of the beloved Terra. As we monitor the consciousness around the planet, we see many focusing their attention on the events occurring in what you call your Middle East. In the focusing comes the energy that will most assuredly cause manifestation, as that is one of the laws of the universe. In other words, the law states that what one focuses one attention on is what one will manifest. This is so. The fate and direction of the world will be decided within the next 21 years. This light timeline was set into motion by the precession of the equinoxes and has been written since the beginning of time. It describes the motion of the stars and the vibrational frequency that will determine the position of the earth in the heavens and within the galactic command. 
The events in your Middle East are stepping stones to be used to determine the direction that you can still set for yourselves. <clears throat> they represent the activities between the forces of light and darkness and suggest to the world that the struggle to determine your outcome has only begun. Always at the end of each millennium and before each new age comes the shift of energies. This positioning is that in the heavens is by design and represents the God force and its participation in the evolution of all sentient beings as they move on their paths to reunite with their creator. The children of light on planet Earth can make a tremendous difference in determining the outcome of the struggle that we observe manifesting in the Middle East. To neutralize the negativity, one must understand the laws of the universe and work within these laws to alleviate harm and to produce maximum results through the application of light. Simply put, this means each individual who is intent upon receiving the energy of the highest must know the power within and use that power to maximize their potential on a daily basis. <coughs> The way in which each best serves is to focus attention only on the most positive and highest thought forms one can imagine. That means, my dear children of the command, that one should not focus on fear. The activities occurring in the Middle East facilitate fear in the hearts of humanity. This in turn causes much emotional power to be emitted from the source of your consciousness. We see these vibrations and we measure them with the instruments aboard our starships. We use this information to provide us with the readings of energy currents and waves that continually fluctuate on Earth. We also note patterns of influence that move currents which accomplish the deeds initiated by both sides of the st struggle on your planet of duality. The power within the children of light cannot be underestimated. The power within the children of the command cannot be denied. The light within each soul weighs heavier than the darkness in that the light always wins over darkness. This is truth. If one knows and believes these last words to be true, then one knows that every, quote, defense one needs is truly within the light. Nothing can defeat the forces of the Creator, for it is this force that brings life to the world and to your very existence. When one is surrounded and consumed by, li by light, one does not have to anticipate the fear or darkness. For fear is truly that which keeps one trapped in the illusion of duality. On the path the beloved Tara is taking, there is much to be learned about the concept of duality and oneness. In the higher realms of consciousness, one is enabled to see that all is in a continuum and that there are no opposites. Instead, the perceived posi positions of strengths and weaknesses are truly nothing more than shades and tints of the same belief system. In the position of one reference comes the understanding and appreciation of the other. Those who understand this will automatically have an inside advantage in working with the forces of light and trying to change the destiny of the world. Those who know the oneness concept will truly know how to release the fears related to the present situation in the Middle East and how to accommodate the needed changes by adhering to the highest vibrational frequency found. What this means on a practical level is that consciousness and essence are truly one with the creative forces of the universe. Since all of creation comes from light and sound vibration, then each of you has the power to change the direction of the world by becoming one with it. You do this through focusing your mind and controlling your thoughts. By mastering these procedures, you also learn to focus your attention. In the beginning of this message, I repeated, that energy follows thought, and that it was this process that creates the manifestation powers. If you visualize the world in the highest of thought forms, you will intuitively know that in the oneness concept, you are participating in creating a higher consciousness and world around you. If you apply this principle to the attention you give the Middle East situation, then you will understand the great power you have to change the course of world events. The greatest illusion around you, O oh children of the Nile, is the fear that fear is a reality. You create this with your thoughts, words, actions, and emotions, and actively participate in this manifestation through such avenues as your media channels, news reports, and other methods for obtaining information. Look within yourselves for the calmness and point of power that is yours. 
Control the universe from within through your observations of the outer thermometer readings. Know the signs of the illusion and calm your inner seas whenever you feel the urge to cast doubtful or fearful thoughts on the world. Know that every time you participate in this behavior, that you cooperate with the forces of darkness that work to keep you imprisoned in the illusion. Your trials and tests are within yourselves. Before you can be free, you must first know that only you can free yourselves by mastering your own minds and hearts. The key to a successful journey is listening to the heart. The heart has and always will have the power to guide you to the light, which is the ultimate destiny for each. You need only understand this for the future. Learn to go inward to hear the inner voice of truth telling you which way to step on your path. The trials for each of you will intensify in the months and years to come. But as each incident crosses your path, know with all assurance that the trials are only presented to you to strengthen your approach to the light. Know that each servant on earth is loved with equal intensity by the creator of the all. And remember the concept of oneness that governs the universe. Judge not another, for the thoughts you create and the fears of your illusion will come back to haunt you. Watch your own paths and the light within your own souls to guide you in making decisions on what you will focus. Remember always that we guide and lift any individual who seeks our vibration and will protect all who journey with us in the light of our most radiant one. The events of the Middle East will take a sudden turn in the days and weeks to come. Watch with true amazement as you anticipate the action of the light force that you most assuredly command. Never doubt for a moment the power of the command as it guides you to your destiny. Never falter for a minute as you move with the currents that so clearly will carry you emotionally to your destinies. Keep watch and a vigil. Cast the light in your meditations and prayers to your sisters and brothers in the troubled waters of your world. Know that with your power of being one with the universe that you actually command that much energy to make a difference. Visualize the peace, love, harmony, and abundance for which each of you yearns for in your hearts. Take the assignment seriously, for we need and request your attention and assistance in this most vital effort. The time is now. The time is never too late. The course of the beloved Terra is truly in your hands. You need not be physically present to assist any sister or brother in need. Send the thoughts of the light and protection through each of your higher selves, and we respond to your side with an intensity that you truly do not understand today. Ask and he shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened. This is our promise to all of you. We serve all on this path to the light, and we raise the vibrations of any soul who truthfully wishes to move with us on their journey. The galactic command of the Brotherhood of the All knows your struggle and understands your pain. We are here to assist you on your journey as you birth the planet Earth into a star within the next two decades. The decree states we cannot interfere because of the free will that has been granted to you. We can, however, assist if you request. We can also provide protection if you should ask our assistance. We do not discriminate, nor do we judge. On the fifth dimensions and higher, in this parsec of the universe, we seem only the oneness in the struggle of each soul. We see some more advanced than others and have compassion for those who vibrate on the most dense levels, for we know that they understand not the ecstasy awaiting should they so choose it. But it is the choosing that brings the rewards, O oh sisters and brothers, for each reaps that which he or she chooses. This also is another law of the universe. The laws that govern all sentient beings are just and they are swift. They operate with precision and with truth. Few understand, however, that each is the center of his or her own universe and that all do create their own realities by the use or misuse of these laws. We watch and monitor the pain and joys all so skillfully bring into their lives. We have compassion for those who do not understand, for their consciousness is blinded by lower vibrational rates that they govern. We rejoice with those who pull themselves from the darkness and choose the light, for we know that as soon as their karmic wheels are emptied, that they too will understand the concept of oneness and learn of the power they command to create beauty all around. 
The earth awaits for the consciousness of the children of light to be so lifted that they will raise the vibrations of the entire planet. She has slept for centuries under the burdens and heaviness of negativity and waits with patience for the long slumber to end. All of the subjects that will be in attendance at the conference you will soon attend are awaiting to be aroused. They understand not the power that lies dormant within and await with hungry appetites to serve the light and the commands of the highest. We monitor all and await to be reunited with the children who wish to serve, for it is in the serving that you will be served. It is in the serving that you will focus. It is in the focusing that you will participate in the manifestation process. And it is in the manifestation process that you will reclaim your power. O children of the lost tribes of Israel, turn your eyes and hearts to the divine and remember from whence you have come. Know clearly that your missions are fast approaching to the decade of the 90s so that you may call upon your highest purpose to serve humanity. Help deliver your sisters and brothers from the death and destruction that awaits in the shadows of darkness. And at all times, never underestimate your powers in the light. When you read documents or participate in activities that raise fear in your hearts, know instantly that those are of the signs that alert, alert you to losing your power. Monitor them in your hearts. Understand clearly that if you focus on those lower vibrations that you will participate in the creation of those events. Walk freely from all sources that cause you to tremble or lose the light in your hearts and minds. Keep the power of the light around you at all times and walk with your shields up. Know that all the protection that you will ever need is already within you and that you are divine. You are the creation of the light and are the co-creators of the world. You have only momentarily forgotten this. I love that line. You have been lost, but the most radiant one is soon to, re soon to return to reunite you to the path. He awaits your return to the glory and the magnificence of the divine. We all rejoice at your awareness and turn our attention to guiding you with great care and dedication as you tread lightly to find your inner truths and beauty. Stay focused on the light. Know that only you are the masters of your own destiny. Know that you will create all that you focus your attention on. Therefore, walk in the days to come with a united front. Move your hearts and forces to the points on earth that so desperately need your help. Provide us the opportunity to answer your calls and never forget to ask. We wait to serve you. Godspeed, O colleagues of the command. Know that your destinies are secured in the light in the days to come. There is no other way for the forces that are being sent to earth during these troubled times will move all to the destinations that each chooses. Hear these words with great caution and clarity, for time is running out. As I promised in the beginning of my transmission, I have highlighted many subjects for your consideration, for there is much of importance you must understand. Following the understanding will come responsibility. Following understanding will emerge the legion of light workers who will assume the command of leadership for the future. Look around you this day, for many of these souls are among you. I say this with much assurance, for in the dimension in which we reside, there is no such thing as time and space. Therefore, on one level, your conference has already conferred in the etheric, and we know the vibrational frequency of each soul who has already attended. I now close this communication in love and light. I wait to view the response in this transmission and plea. Adonai, O daughters and sons of the Most Radiant One, I am Kathuna. He's so magnificent. I just, I'm so humbled, you know, this being. I just want to close this presentation with the fact that the message is obvious that all of us have a lot of work to do. Right? That, and we can do it in the privacy of our own homes as well as we can on our jobs and wherever we are. And I happen to think of 
a man who I love very, very dearly, and that's the late John F. Kennedy, the president. And I happened to think of some words that he had used because he was so inspirational, and I'd like to leave you today with those words as we contemplate the seriousness and the importance of the responsibility ahead. And he said one time, if not you, who? If not now, when? Thank you.